Okay, up. Okay, this is my <clears throat> Chapter six, the festivities. Italics. This is one of those chapters again where Professor Bongiorno of Columbia, the Florinese guru, claims that Morgenstern's satiric genius is at its fullest flower. That's the way this guy talks. Fullest flower, delicious drolleries, on and on. This festivities chapter is mostly detailed descriptions of, guess what? Bingo, the festivities. It's like 89 days till the nuptials and every high muckamuck in Florin has to give a due for the couple and what Morgenstern fills his pages with is how the various Richies of the time entertained. What kind of parties, what kind of food, who did the decorations, how did the seating arrangements get settled, all that kind of thing. The only interesting part, but it's not worth going through 44 pages for, is that Prince Humperdinck gets more and more interested in Mannerly toward Buttercup, cutting down even a little on his hunting activities. And, more important, because of the foiling of the kidnapping attempt, three things happen. One, everyone is pretty well convinced that the plot was engineered by Gilder, so relations between the countries are more than a little strained. Two, Buttercup is just adored by everybody because the rumors are all over that she acted very brave and even came through the fire swamp alive. And three, Prince Humperdinck is at last, in his own land, a hero. He was never popular, what with his hunting fetish and leaving the country to kind of rot once his old man got senile. But the way he foiled the kidnapping made everybody realize that this was some brave fella and they were lucky to have him next in line to lead them. Anyhow, these 44 pages cover just about the first month of party giving, and it's not till the end of that that, for my money, things get going again. Buttercup is in bed, pooped, it's late, the end of another long party, and as she waits for sleep, she wonders what sea Wesley is riding on, and the giant and the Spaniard, whatever happened to them. So eventually, in three quick flashbacks, Morgenstern returns to what I think is the story. When Inigo regained consciousness, it was still night on the Cliffs of Insanity. Far below, the waters of Florin Channel pounded. Inigo stirred, blinked, and tried to rub his eyes. Couldn't. His arms were tied together around a tree. Inigo blinked again, banishing cobwebs. He had gone on his knees to the man in black, ready for death. Clearly, the victor had other notions. Do not. I'm go wearing my bracelet. Okay, but stop going through my purse. Um, Inigo looked around as best he could, and there it was the six-fingered sword glittering in the moonlight like lost magic. Inigo stretched his right leg as far as it would go and managed to touch the handle. Then it was simply a matter of inching the weapon close enough to be graspable by one hand, and then it was an even simpler task to slash his bindings. He was dizzy when he stood, and he rubbed his head behind his ear where the man in black had struck him. A lump, sizable to be sure, but not a major problem. The major problem was what to do now. Vizzini had strict instructions for occasions such as this when a plan went wrong. Go back to the beginning. Back to the beginning and wait for Vizzini, then regroup, replan, start again. Inigo had made a little rhyme out of it for Fezzik, so the giant would not have problems remembering what to do in time of trouble. Fool, fool, back to the beginning is the rule. Inigo knew precisely where the beginning was. They had gotten the job in Florin City itself, the thieves' quarter. Vizzini had made the arrangements alone, as he always did. He had met with their employer, had accepted the job, had planned it all in the thieves' quarter. So, the thieves' quarter was clearly the place to go. Only, Inigo hated it there. Everybody was so dangerous, big, mean, and muscular. And so what if he was the greatest fencer in the world? Who'd know it to look at him? He looked like a skinny Spanish guy. It might be fun to rob. You couldn't walk around with a sign saying, Be careful, this is the greatest fencer since the death of the Wizard of Corsica. Do not burgle. Besides... And here, Inigo felt a deep pain. He wasn't that great a fencer. Not anymore. He couldn't be. Hadn't he just been beaten? Once, true, he had been a titan, but now, now... Italics. What happens here that you aren't going to read is the six-page soliloquy from Inigo in which Morgenstern, through Inigo, reflects on the anguish of fleeting glory. The reason for the soliloquy here is that Morgenstern's previous book had gotten bombed by the critics and also hadn't sold beans. Aside, did you know that Robert Browning's first book of poems didn't sell one copy? True. 
Even his mother didn't buy it at her local bookstore. Have you ever heard anything more humiliating? How would you like to have been Browning and it's your first book and you have these secret hopes that now, now you'll be somebody. Established, important, and you give it a week before you ask the publisher how things are going because you don't want to seem pushy or anything and then maybe you drop by and it was probably all very English and understated in those days and you're Browning and you chit chat around a bit before you drop the biggie. Oh, by the way, any notions yet on how my poems might be doing? And then his editor, who has been dreading this moment, probably says, well, you know how it is with poetry these days. Nothing's taking off like it used to. Requires a bit of time for the word to get around. And then finally, somebody had to say it. None, Bob. Sorry, Bob, no. We haven't had one authenticated sale. We thought for a bit that Hatchards had a potential buyer down by Piccadilly, but it didn't quite work out. Sorry, Bob. Of course, we'll keep you posted in the event of a breakthrough. End of aside. Anyway, Inigo finishes his speech to the cliffs and spends the next few hours finding a fisherman who sails him back to Florin City. The thieves' quarter was worse than he remembered. Always before, Fezzik had been with him, and they made rhymes, and Fezzik was enough to keep any thief away. Inigo moved panic up the dark streets, desperately afraid. Why, this giant fear, what was he afraid of? He sat on a filthy stoop and pondered. Around him there were cries in the night, and from the alehouses, vulgar laughter. He was afraid, he realized then, because as he sat there, gripping the six-fingered sword for confidence, he was suddenly back to what he had been before Vizzini had found him. A failure. A man without point, with no attachment to tomorrow. Inigo had not touched brandy in years. Now he felt his fingers fumbling for money. Now he heard his footsteps running toward the nearest a brush your hair? ale house. Um, yep. Now he saw his money on the counter. Now he felt the brandy bottle in his hands. Back to the stoop he ran. He opened the bottle. He smelled the rough brandy. He took a sip. He coughed. He took a swallow. He coughed again. He gulped it down and coughed and gulped some more and half began a smile. His fears were starting to leave him. After all, why should he have even been afraid? He was an Ingo Montoya. The bottle was half gone now. Son of the great Domingo Montoya. So what was there in the world worth fearing? Now all the brandy was gone. How dare fear approach a wizard such as Ingo Montoya? Well, never again. Into the second bottle. Never, 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 never again. He sat alone and confident and strong. His life was straight and fine. He had money enough for brandy, and if you had that, you had the world. The stoop was wretched and bleak. Inigo slumped there, quite contented, clutching the bottle in his once trembling hands. Existence was really very simple when you did what you were told, and nothing could be simpler or better than what he had in store. All he had to do was wait and drink until Vizzini came. Fezzik had no idea how long he was unconscious. He only knew as he staggered to his feet on the mountain path that his throat was very sore where the man in black had strangled him. What to do? The plans had all gone wrong. Fezzik closed his eyes, trying to think. There was a proper place to go when plans went wrong, but he couldn't quite remember it. Inigo had even made up a rhyme for him so he wouldn't forget. Now, even with that, he was so stupid he had forgotten. Was that it? Was it stupid, stupid, go and wait for Vizzini with Cupid? That rhymed, but where was the Cupid? Dummy, dummy, go out now and fill your tummy. That rhymed too, but what kind of instructions were those? What to do? What to do? Dunce, dunce, use your brains and do it right for once? No help. Nothing was any help. He never had done anything right, not in his whole life, until Vizzini came. And without another thought, Fezzik ran off into the night after the Sicilian. Vizzini was napping when he got there. He had been drinking wine and dozed off. Fezzik dropped to his knees and put his hands in prayer position. Vizzini... I'm sorry, he began. Vizzini napped on. Fezzik shook him gently. Vizzini did not wake. Not so gently this time. Nothing. Oh, I see. You're dead, Fezzik said. He stood up. He's dead, Vizzini is, he said softly. And then, with not a bit of help from his brain, a great scream of panic burst from his throat into the night. Inigo! And he whirled back down the mountain path, because if Inigo was alive, it would be all right. 
It wouldn't be the same. No, it could never be that without the Zini to order them and insult them as only he could, but at least there would be time for poetry. And when Fezzik reached the cliffs of insanity, he said, Inigo, Inigo, here I am! To the rocks, and I'm here, Inigo, it's your Fezzik! To the trees, and Inigo, Inigo, answer me, please! All over until there was no other conclusion to draw, but that just as there was now no Vizzini, so there was also no Inigo. And that was hard. It was, in point of fact, too hard for Fezzik, so he began to run, crying out, Be with you in a minute, Inigo, and right behind you, Inigo, and hey, Inigo, wait up! Wait up, straight up, which was the way he ran, and wouldn't there be fun with rhymes once he and Inigo were together again? But after an hour or so of shouting, his throat gave out because he had, after all, been strangled almost to death in the very recent past. On he ran, on and on and on, until finally he reached a tiny village and found, just outside town, some nice rocks that formed kind of a cave, almost big enough for him to stretch out in. He sat with his back against a rock and his hands around Mom, his I knees. Did it, and I even clipped it so it would stay for you. Nice. Does, does it die in the chapter? No. And his throat hurting until the village boys found him. They held their breath and crept as close as they dared. As it hoped they would go away, so he froze, pretending to be off with Inigo, and Inigo would say Beryl, and Fezzik right quick would come back Carol, and maybe they would sing a little something until Inigo said Serenade, and you couldn't stump Fezzik with one that easy because of centigrade, and then Inigo would make a word about the weather, and Fezzik would rhyme it, and that was how it went until the village boys stopped being afraid of him. Fezzik could tell that because they were creeping very close to him now, and all of a sudden yelling their lungs out and making crazy faces. Charles, can you let Kelly out? He didn't really blame them. He looked like the kind of person you did that to. Mocked. His clothes were torn and his throat was gone and his... Can you wait for a second? Yeah. We're going to have to pause. Okay. His clothes were torn and his throat was gone and his eyes were wild and he probably would have yelled too if he'd been their age. It was only when they found him funny that he found it, though he did not know the word degrading. No more yelling. Just, ow! Okay, unclip it if you want to unbraid it, otherwise you will hurt me. No more yelling. Just laughter now. Laughter, Fezzik thought, and then he thought giraffeter, because that's all he was to them. Some huge, funny thing that couldn't make much noise. Laughter, giraffeter, from now to hereafter. Fezzik huddled up in his cave and tried looking on the bright side. At least they weren't throwing things... Okay, I need you to stop, please. At least they weren't throwing things at him. Not yet, anyway. Wesley awoke chained in a giant cage. His shoulder... No, I've asked you to stop. Okay. His shoulder was beginning to fester from the gnawing and digging that the R.O.U.S.s had done into his flesh. He ignored his discomfort momentarily to try and adjust his surroundings. He was certainly underground. It was not the lack of windows that made that sure, more the dankness. From somewhere above him now, he could hear animal sounds, an occasional lion roar, the yelp of the cheetah. Shortly after his return to consciousness, the albino appeared, bloodless, with skin as pale as a dying birch. The candlelight that served to illuminate the cage made the albino seem totally like a creature who had never seen the sun. The albino held a tray which carried many things, bandages and food, healing powders and brandy. Where are we? From Wesley. A shrug from the albino. Who are you? Shrug. That was almost the entire extent of the fellow's conversation. Wesley asked question after question while the albino tended and redressed his wound, then fed him food that was warm and surprisingly good and plentiful. Shrug. Shrug. Who knows I'm here? Shrug. Lie, but tell me something. Give an answer. Who knows I'm here? Whispered. They know. They? Shrug. The prince and the count, you mean. Nod. And that's all? Nod. When I was brought in, I was half conscious. The count was giving the orders, but three soldiers were carrying me. They know, too. Shake. Whispered. No. They're dead? That's what you're saying? Shrug. Am I to die, then? Shrug. Wesley lay back on the floor of the giant underground cage, watching as the albino silently reloaded the tray and glided from sight. 
Can we pause for a second and try and unclog my nose? Hold on, I'm almost done. If the soldiers were dead, surely it was not, come here, not unreasonable to assume that he would eventually follow. But if they wanted his erasure, surely it was also not unreasonable to assume that they had not the least intention of doing it immediately. Else why tend his wounds? Why return his strength with good warm food? No, his death would be a while yet. But in the meantime... Considering the personalities of his captors, it was finally not unreasonable to assume that they would do their best to make him suffer. Greatly. Wesley closed his eyes. There was pain coming, and he had to be ready for it. He had to prepare his brain, so he had to get his mind controlled and safe from their efforts, so that they could not break him. He would not let them break him. He would hold together against anything and all. If only they gave him sufficient time to make ready, he knew he could defeat pain. It turned out they gave him sufficient time. It was months before the machine was ready. But they broke him anyway. Okay.